Hello, BookTube, and welcome back to our read-along of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's thrilling novel, The Hound of the Baskervilles. Several of you were asking over the last few days where my own Hound of the Baskervilles is. She's right there. <laughs> She's right there. She's not very big. <laughs> we are up to uh, Chapter 6. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson have met Sir Henry Baskerville, the heir to the doomed Baskerville estate, uh, brought to Holmes' attention by Dr. Mortimer because the previous Sir Charles Baskerville, the, the previous owner of the title, the previous resident of Baskerville Hall, died abruptly of a heart attack and seems to have been attended in his final moments by a monstrous hound of the type that old legends say haunts the family. Uh, and in the last chapter, we saw that Holmes has decided that Watson will go back to Devonshire, to Baskerville Hall, with the heir and Dr. Mortimer. But Holmes must stay in London. He can't go with them. Uh, and that's where we pick up here in Chapter 6, which is called Baskerville Hall. Sir Henry Baskerville and Dr. Mortimer were ready upon the appointed day, and we started, as arranged, for Devonshire. Mr. Sherlock Holmes drove with me to the station and gave me his last parting injunctions and advice. I will not bias your mind by suggesting theories and suspicions, Watson, said he. I wish you simply to report facts in the fullest possible manner to me, and you can leave me to do the theorizing. What sort of facts? I asked. Anything which may seem to have a bearing upon, uh, however indirect, upon the case, and especially the relations between young Baskerville and his neighbors and any fresh particulars concerning the death of Sir Charles. I have made some inquiries myself in the last few days, but the results have, I fear, been negative. One thing only appears to be certain, that is, that Mr. James Desmond, who is the next heir, is an elderly gentleman of very amiable disposition, so that his persecution does not arise, this persecution does not arise from him. Keep in mind, we haven't seen much in the way of persecution for the heir. He's been followed. Uh, who hasn't been followed when they've been in London? It happened to me six or seven times. <laughs> I really think we can, that we may eliminate him entirely from our calculations. There remains the people who will actually surround Sir Henry Baskerville upon the moor. Notice, although that's Sherlock Holmes saying to Watson, we can eliminate Mr. Desmond from our calculations, what it really is is Doyle saying, we can eliminate that. With a, you're not going to have to think about that anymore. If, if Holmes has ruled it out, then it's not anything that's going to pop up in Chapter 30. Would it not be well, in first place, to get rid of this Barrymore couple? The Barrymores, the old, the old retainers at Baskerville Hall. By no means. You could not make a greater mistake. If they are innocent, it would be a cruel injustice. And if they are guilty, we should be giving up all chance of bringing it home to them. No, no. We will preserve them upon our list of suspects. Then there is the groom at, uh, at the hall, if I remember right. There are two moorland farmers. There is our friend Dr. Mortimer, whom I believe to be entirely honest. And there is his wife, of whom we know nothing. There is this naturalist Stapleton. And there is his sister, who is said to be a young lady of attractions. There is Mr. Fra Franklin of Laughter Hall, who is an, also an unknown factor, and there are one or two other neighbors. These are the folk who must be your very special study. I will do my best. You have arms, I suppose? Yes, I thought it well to take them. Most certainly. Keep your revolver next to you night and day, and never relax your precautions. Keep in mind, we have not seen anything. We have not. The reader has not seen anything that would justify that on, in Holmes's mind. We've not seen anything deadly. Uh, the coroner's interest returned a verdict of death by natural causes for Sir Charles. A footprint in the, in the dirt on the U alley does not equate, it, from what we've seen so far, to the, a danger so necessary that Watson needs to carry his revolver with him at all times, day and night. Holmes has other ideas. Uh, our friends had already secured the first-class carriage and we were waiting for us upon the platform. No, we've had no news of any kind, said Dr. Mortimer, in answer to my friend's questions. I can swear to one thing, and that is that we have not been shadowed during the last two days. We have never gone out without keeping a sharp watch, and no one else could have escaped our notice. You always kept together, I presume? Except yesterday afternoon. I usually give up one day to pure amusement when I come to town, so I spent it at the Museum of the College of Surgeons. And I went to look at the folk in the park, said Baskerville, but we had no trouble of any kind. It was imprudent all the same, said Holmes, shaking his head and looking very grave. I beg you, Sir Henry, that you will not go about alone. Some great misfortune will befall you if you do. Did you get your other boot? No, sir. It's gone forever. Indeed, that is very interesting. Well, goodbye, he added as the train began to glide down the platform. Bear in mind, Sir Henry, one of the phrases in that queer old legend which Dr. Mortimer has read to us, and avoid the moor in the hours of darkness. 
when the powers of evil are exalted. I looked back at the platform when we had left it far behind and saw the tall, austere figure of Holmes standing motionless and gazing after us. Because uh, not only is Holmes telling Watson, keep your gun by you at all times, but he's telling Sir Henry that something evil will befall you if you go out, if you are not accompanied by someone else. Not might, but will. The journey was a swift and pleasant one, and I spent it in making the more intimate acquaintance of my two companions and playing with Dr. Mortimer's spaniel. Thank you. In a very few hours, the brown earth had become ruddy, and brick had changed to granite, and red cows grazed in well-hedged fields where the lush grasses and more luxuriant vegetation spoke of a richer, if a damper, climate. Young Baskerville stared eagerly out of the window and cried aloud with delight as he recognized the familiar features of the Devon scenery. I've been over a good part of the world since I left it, Dr. Watson, said he, but I have never seen a place to compare with it. I never saw a Devonshire man who did not swear by his country, I remarked. It's a pretty good country. It doesn't really compare to the glories of Kent, but it, it's a pretty good country. <laughs> uh, it depends upon the breed of men as quite as much as, the, as on the county, said Dr. Mortimer. A glance at our friend here reveals the rounded head of the Celt, which carries inside it the Celtic enthusiasm and power of attachment. Poor Sir Charles's head was of a very rare type, half Gaelic, half Ivernian in its characteristics, but you were very young when you last saw Baskerville Hall, were you not? <laughs> He's still on about the phrenology. And also, th this is Doyle serving the reader. Of course, if, if Dr. Mortimer and Sir Henry Baskerville had been in each other's company almost all the time for three or four days, of course Dr. Mortimer has asked him this question before now. This is for us. Uh, I was a boy in my teens at the time of my father's death, and had never seen the hall, for he lived in a little cottage on the south coast. Thence I went straight to a friend in America. I tell you, it is all as new to me as it is to Dr. Watson, and I'm as keen as possible to see the moor. Are you? Then your wish is easily granted, for there is your first sight of the moor, said Dr. Mortimer, pointing out of the carriage window. Uh, over the green squares of the fields and the low curve of the woods, there rose in the distance a gray, melancholy hill with a strange, jagged summit, dim and vague in the distance, like some fantastic landscape in a dream. Baskerville sat for a long time, his eyes fixed upon it, and I read upon his eager face how much it meant to him, this first sight of the strange spot where the men of his blood had held sway for so long and left their mark so deep. There he sat, with his tweed suit and his American accent, in a corner of a prosaic railway carriage, and yet as I looked at his dark and expressive face I felt more than ever how true a descendant he was of that long line of high-blooded, fiery, and masterful men. There were pride, valor, strength in his long, thick brows, and his sensitive nostrils, and his large, hazel eyes. If on that forbidding moor a difficult or dangerous quest should lie before us, this was at least a comrade for whom one might venture to take a risk with the certainty that he would bravely share it. So, Dr. Mortimer is examining his skull, and Watson is examining his physiognomy, and they're both drawing estimations, but... The train pulled up at a small wayside station, and we all descended. Outside, beyond the low white fence, a wagonette with a pair of cobs was waiting. Our coming was evidently a great event, for the station master and porters clustered round us to carry out our luggage. It was a sweet, simple country spot, but I was surprised to observe that by the gate there stood two soldierly men in dark uniforms, who leaned upon their short rifles and glanced keenly at us as we passed. The coachman, a hard-faced, gnarled little fellow, saluted Sir Henry Baskerville, and in a few moments we were flying swiftly down the broad, white road. Rolling pasture lands curved upwards on either side of us, and the old gabled houses peeped out from amid the thick green foliage, but behind the peaceful and sunlit countryside there rose ever, dark against the evening sky, the long, gloomy curve of the moor, broken by the jagged and sinister hills. The wagonette swung round into a side road, and we curved upward through deep lanes worn by centuries of wheels, high banks on either side, heavy with dripping moss and fleshy heart's tongue ferns. Bronzing bracken and mottled bramble gleamed in the light of the sinking sun. Still steadily rising, we passed over a narrow granite bridge and skirted a noisy stream which gushed swiftly down, foaming and roaring amid the gray boulders. Both the road and the stream wound up through a valley dense with scrub oak and fir, at every turning, Baskerville gave an exclamation of delight, looking eagerly about him and asking countless questions. To his eyes, all seemed beautiful, but to me, a tinge of melancholy lay upon the countryside, 
which bore so clearly the mark of the waning year. Yellow leaves carpeted the lanes and fluttered down upon us as we passed. The rattle of our wheels died away as we drove through drifts of rotting vegetation, sad gifts, as it seemed to me, for nature to throw before the carriage wheels of the returning heir of the Baskervilles. Hello, cried Dr. Mortimer, what is this? A steep curve of heathland, an outlying spur of the moor, lay in front of us. On the summit, hard and clear like an equestrian statue upon its pedestal, was a mounted soldier, dark and stern, his rifle poised ready over his forearm. He was watching the road along which we traveled. What is this, Perkins? asked Dr. Mortimer. Our driver half turned in his seat. There's a convict escaped from Princetown, sir. He's been out three days now, and the warders watch every road and every station, but they've had no sight of him yet. The farmers about here don't like it, sir, and that's a fact. Well, I understand they get five pounds if they can give information. Yes, sir, but the chance of five pounds is but a poor thing compared to the chance of having your throat cut. You see, it isn't like this ordinary. This is an ordinary convict. This man would stick at nothing. Who is he, then? It is Selden, the Notting Hill murderer. I remembered the case well, for it was one in which Holmes had taken an interest on account of the peculiar ferocity of the crime and the wanton brutality which had marked all the actions of the assassin. The commutation of his death sentence had been due to some doubts as to his complete sanity, so atrocious was his conduct. Our wagonette had topped a rise, and in front of us rose the huge expanse of the moor, mottled and gnarled and craggy cairns and tors. A cold wind swept down from it and set us shivering. Somewhere there, on that desolate plain, was lurking that fiendish man, hiding in a burrow like a wild beast, his heart full of malignancy against the whole race which had cast him out. It needed but this to complete the grim suggestiveness of the barren waste, the chilling wind, the darkling sky. Even Baskerville fell silent and pulled his overcoat more closely around him. We had left the fertile country behind and beneath us. We look back on it now, the slanting rays of the low sun turning the streams to threads of gold and glowing on the red earth new turned by the plow and the broad tangle of the woodlands. The road in front of us grew bleaker and wilder over huge russet and olive slopes sprinkled with giant boulders. Now and then we passed a moorland cottage, walled and roofed with stone, with no creeper to break its harsh outline. Suddenly we looked down into a cup-like depression, patched with stunted oaks and firs which had been twisted and bent by the fury of years of storm. Two high, narrow towers rose over the trees. The driver pointed with his whip. Baskerville Hall, said he. Not exactly an auspicious homecoming. <laughs> Note Doyle's descriptive ability here. We'll get back to that. But uh, Its master had risen and was staring with flushed cheeks and shining eyes. A few minutes later, we had reached the lodge gates, a maze of fantastic tracery and wrought iron with weather-bitten pillars on either side, blotched with lichens and surmounted by the boar's heads of the Baskervilles. The lodge was a ruin of black granite and barbed ribs of rafters, but facing it was a new building, half-constructed, the first fruit of Sir Charles's South African gold. Through the gateway we passed into the avenue, where the wheels were again hushed amid the leaves, and the old trees shot their branches in a somber tunnel over our heads. Baskerville shuddered as he looked up the long, dark drive to where the house glimmered like a ghost at the farther end. Was it here? he asked in a low voice. No, no, the U Alley is on the other side. I want to know if this is the place where, where, where uh, Sir Charles died. It's no wonder my uncle felt as if trouble were coming on him in a place such as this, said he. It's enough to scare any man. I'll have a row of electric lamps up here inside of six months, and you won't know it again, with a thousand candle power swan and innocent right here in front of the old hall door. The avenue opened into a broad expanse of turf, and the house lay before us. In the fading light, I could see that the center was a heavy block of building, from which a porch projected. The whole front was draped in ivy, with a patch clipped bare here and there for a window or a coat of arms to break through the dark veil. From this central block rose the twin towers, ancient, crenellated, and pierced with many loopholes. To the right and left of the turrets were more modern wings of black granite. A dull light shone through heavy mullion windows, and from the high chimneys which rose from the steep, high-angled roofs, there sprang a single column of black smoke. Welcome, Sir Henry. Welcome to Baskerville Hall. A tall man stepped from the shadows of the porch to open the door of the wagonette. The figure of a woman was silhouetted against the yellow light of the hall. She came out and helped the man to hand down our bags. You don't mind my driving straight home, Sir Henry, said Dr. Mortimer. Why, why, my wife is expecting me. Surely you will stay and have some dinner. 
No, I must go. I shall probably find some work awaiting me. I would stay to show you over the house, but Barry Moore is better suited a guide than I. Goodbye, and never hesitate night or day to send for me if I can be of service. Exit, Dr. Morton. The wheels died away down the driveway, and Sir Henry and I turned into the hall, and the door clanged heavily behind us. It was a fine old apartment in which we found ourselves, large, lofty, and heavily raftered with huge balks of aged blackened oak. In the great old-fashioned fireplace behind the iron dogs of a, lo a log fire crackled and snapped. Sir Henry and I held out our hands to it, for we were numb from our long drive. Then we gazed round us at the high, thin windows of old stained glass, the oak paneling, the stag's heads, the codes of iron upon the walls, all dim and somber in the subdued light of a central lamp. It's just as I imagined it, said Sir Henry. It's not the, is it not the very picture of an old family home? To think that this should be the same hall for, in which for five hundred years my people have lived, it strikes me solemn to think of it. I saw his dark face lit up with boyish enthusiasm as he gazed about him. The light beat upon him where he stood, but long shadows trailed down the walls and hung like a black canopy above him. Barrymore had returned from taking our luggage to our rooms. He stood in front of us now in the subdued manner of a well-trained servant. He was a remarkable-looking man, tall, handsome, with a square black beard and pale, distinguished features. Would you wish dinner to be served at once, sir? Is it ready? In a very few minutes, sir. You will find hot water in your rooms. My wife and I will be happy, Sir Henry, to stay with you until you have made your fresh arrangements. But you will understand that under the new conditions, this house will require a considerable staff. What new conditions? I only meant, sir, that Sir Charles led a very retired life, and we were able to look after his wants. You would naturally wish to have more company, and so will need changes in your household. Do you mean that your wife and you wish to leave? Only when it is quite convenient to you, sir. But your family has been with us for several generations, have they not? I should be sorry to begin my life here by breaking an old family connection. I seem to discern some signs of emotion upon the butler's white face. The hound is on the move. Do you want to get down here? Hmm? It's all right. It's, it's all right. Go ahead. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, goodness. Oh. <laughs> all right. Well, you got out of the Baskervilles and some Frida yoga. <laughs> uh, I feel that also, sir, and so does my wife. But to tell the truth, sir, we were both very much attached to Sir Charles, and his death gave us a shock and made these surroundings very painful to us. I fear that we shall never again be easy in our minds at Baskerville Hall. But what do you intend to do? I have no doubt, sir, that we shall succeed in establishing ourselves in some business. Sir Charles's generosity has given us the means to do so, and now, sir, perhaps I'd best show you to your rooms. A square, balustrated gallery ran round the top of the old hall, approached by a double stair. From this central point, two long corridors extended the whole length of the building, from which all the bedrooms opened. My own was in the same wing as, Sir Bas as Baskerville's, almost next door to it. These rooms appeared to be much more modern than the central part of the house, and the bright paper and numerous candles did something to remove the somber impression which our arrival had left upon my mind. But the dining room, which opened out of the hall, was a place of shadow and gloom. It was a long chamber with a step separating the dais from the f where, where the family sat, from the lower portion reserved for their dependents. <laughs> My own dependents causing me a little trouble here. <laughs> uh, at one end of the minstrel's gallery, overlooked it. Black beams shot across above our heads with a smoke-darkened ceiling beyond them. With rows of flaring torches to light it up, the color and rude hilarity of an old-time banquet, it might have been softened. But now, when two black-clothed gentlemen sat in a little circle of light thrown by a shaded lamp, one's voice became hushed and one's spirit subdued. A dim line of ancestors in every variety of dress, from the Elizabethan knight to the buck of the Regency, stared down upon us and daunted us by their silent company, meaning family portraits on the walls. We talked little, and I for one was glad when the meal was over and we were able to retire into the modern billiard room and smoke a cigarette. My word, it isn't a very cheerful place, said Sir Henry. I suppose one can tone down to it, but I feel a bit out of picture at present. I don't wonder that my uncle got a little jumpy if he lived all alone in such a house as this. However, if it suits you, we will retire early tonight, and perhaps things may seem more cheerful in the morning. I drew aside my curtains before I went to bed and looked out from my window. It opened upon the grassy space which lay in front of the hall door. 
Beyond, two copses of trees moaned and swung in a rising wind. A half-moon broke through the rifts of racing clouds. In its cold light I saw beyond the trees a broken fringe of rocks and the long, low curve of the melancholy moor. I closed the curtain, feeling that my last impression was in keeping with the rest. And yet it was not quite the last. I found myself weary and yet wakeful, tossing restlessly from side to side, seeking for the sleep which would not come. Far away, a, cl a chiming clock struck out the quarters of the hour, but otherwise a deathly silence lay upon the house. And then suddenly, in the very dead of the night, there came a sound to my ears, clear, resonant, and unmistakable. It was the sob of a woman, the muffled, strangling gasp of one who is torn by an uncontrollable sorrow. I sat up in bed and listened intently. The noise could not have been far away and was certainly in the house. For half an hour I waited with every nerve on alert, but there came no other sound save the chiming clock and the rustle of the ivy on the walls. And there you go. Uh, so we are now at Baskerville Hall, where the scene of this book is going to take place. And uh, it's all stage setting. Holmes exits, Dr. Mortimer exits, our two analytical experts. Watson might, Holmes might always be telling Watson, you know my methods, employ them. But Watson is not an analytical figure, and neither is Sir Henry. Sir Henry comes across as a bit of an idiot. Uh, Doyle really likes this kind of character, a brave, somewhat dim-witted, but pure-hearted man. Uh, Watson is not an idiot. He is he is very, very sharp and far more worldly. He's twice Sir, Sir Henry's age. Uh, but we're left with them. And Doyle, he knows that he's going to set the rest of the book here, so he spends the whole chapter giving us atmosphere. And boy, oh boy, is it done well. I tell you, he doesn't get the credit that he deserves for evoking all kinds of things. Here, it's a whole natural world. In fact, the change from one natural world to the next. And the house, which has a, it breathes with a character of its own. That is just, it's wonderfully, wonderfully done. And all that business about the cairns and the tours and the, the change in scenery and the breathing moodiness of the place, all that would have to go if The Hound of the Baskervilles were a short story. We'd get a line or two, but we wouldn't get more than that. Here... Doyle knows when to relax a little. He knows that this is not just extra. He wants to give you all the, the atmosphere in the world for the setting of his book. <laughs> so so that, is, that is all that's in our chapter. We don't get much in the way of uh, gotcha moments or anything like that. So we'll move on to the next chapter, <laughs> and I will see you then. Thank you, book two.